Hi, I'm Lara Bennett, and you're listening to Highway Butterfly, the stories of Neil Cassell. Neil was a gifted singer, songwriter, musician, and friend to many. He released 14 albums as a solo artist and collaborated on countless projects with other musicians. After his passing in 2019, his friends and family created the Neil Casal Music Foundation to provide instruments and music lessons to students in New York and New Jersey and to support organizations that offer musicians mental health care. One of the featured projects of the newly formed foundation is the tribute album, Highway Butterfly, The Songs of Neil Casal, a sprawling 41 song collection bringing together a galaxy of rock and roots luminaries. We've asked the contributing musicians to share their memories of Neil and their stories of making the record. Highway Butterfly, The Songs of Neil Casal is out on November 12th. Pre-order the album and learn more about the Neil Casal Music Foundation at neilcasalmusicfoundation.org. Hello and welcome to Highway Butterfly, the Stories of Neil Casal podcast. I'm Gary Waldman. I'll be your guest host for today. And our guest is John Ginty. John is an incredible piano, organ, melodica, plays all kinds of drummer. He's a great drummer. And met Neil in 1991 and played on all of Neil's solo albums, was a huge part of Neil's early career when he was developing the sound that first came out on Fade Away Diamond Time, Neil's first album in 1995. John was there for all the early years, toured the world with Neil, played on every one of his solo albums, as I mentioned. Subsequently, John went on to play with Jewel, Robert Randolph and the Family Band, many years with Citizen Cope, the Dixie Chicks, played on records by Whiskey Town, James Eha, so many more. And he's currently a member of the Allman Betts Band, which is a great thing, and also has his own band, the John Ginty Band, that have released a couple great records. So let's say hello to John and hear some stories of the old days. All right, well, here we go. Hello, John. Hey, Gary. How you doing, man? I'm good, brother. How are you? Good. Happy to see you. Um, you we well. go back a long way, over 30 years. Yeah, over 30 um, years. Yep. So we'll talk about those old days in a minute, but uh, what have you been doing? I know you're plugging away out there on the road with the Almond Betts Band. Yeah, man. Just got home from 12 weeks, 12, 12 weeks out there and and just uh killing it man playing you know averaging five six nights a week uh we were on the spirit of the south tour with blackberry smoke and the wild feathers and that was really cool like outdoor shed festival style vibe like we always like to do and you know it's it's a nice you know the deal that's a nice way to tour man when all you gotta do is go find catering twice a day <laughs> you know you don't have to like hunt for things it's a great way to tour so that made it great and we, a bunch of our own shows and yeah it's it's a weird scene out there man it's um it's touch and go depending on where you are state to state some states feel normal some states don't uh some places you sell x amount of tickets and half that many people show up so it's still feeling its way out but um but we managed to do it safely so that's the important part though mm -hmm. that's great actually 12 weeks straight yeah, 12 weeks. I had I had two or three days off just because we had two or three days off in New Jersey. So mm -hmm. you know how that goes with the tour. Every once in a while, the, the dart hits your town. So I actually put the tour bus down the road at the Old Mill Inn and uh, uh, took the bus driver golfing at our golf course with Buckman. And yeah, we, we, had a, we made a good couple of days out of it. But yeah, other than that, it was 12 solid. Amazing. Oh, I'm glad, glad to hear that, that you're out there plugging away. Um, well, let's take a trip down memory lane. Um, do you remember that? The first time that you heard about Neil, uh, I, and I'm trying to remember, I was sitting here earlier today going, who told us to go see John? I don't know. Well, and it was 1991 when we first saw you playing with the Rose Hill Band, and Neil had decided yeah. he needed a keyboard player. And yeah. somebody suggested you, but I cannot remember who it was. So as I recall, and this, this may or may not be accurate, but we did, uh, Rose Hill had a, a logo that was really, really cool. 
uh, it was uh, it was drawn up by my uh, old high school buddy Dan Zimmer, and we had flyers out. And the the way that I always heard it from Neil was that he really dug the logo. <laughs> it was a really good logo, and uh, I was like, man, we should you know we should go check out that band. And I knew uh, Angie McKenna, and I knew her sister Maggie really well at that point. We had all gone to high school together, so. Um, I don't know. It, it probably somewhat came through Angie and, and I'd always heard the story about the logo. So I actually, I live in Bernardsville now and I'm just a couple blocks away from what used to be Freddy's in Bernardsville. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember doing a Rose Hill show there and there being like two mystery guys sitting at a table. And I think it was you guys. That was the first time that you, <laughs> you saw the band, but, um, but it was actually a wetlands, uh, one of those famous Tuesday night, dead night at wetlands in new york city the wetlands preserve was our our spot that was our dead place. center dead center it was the first uh, like jam band club it was the first uh, thing of that nature and if you've been there then you know what i'm talking about and so they did this tuesday night thing it was like free or next to free to get in it was a buck or something and and they would do uh dead and almond tribute cover bands you know so yeah, that was the first night that I met you guys. I remember you standing in front of the B three that night. So, um, and you came backstage afterwards and gave me a cassette tape of uh, eight of Neil's songs on it, and it had a Warner Brothers logo because he had he had been signed by Jim Cardillo to Warner Chapel at that point. So that was a big deal for me. That was a big night for me. I was you know twenty twenty one years old. <clears throat> Thought you guys were big shots. Oh, we were, of course. <laughs> uh, <Not> you were. <laughs> I, I forgot about going to Freddy's, but now that you mention it, I do remember it. And I, I always loved going to Freddy's. Very low ceiling there. But somehow music sounded yeah. really good in there. And and we came in there. Now that I'm, I do remember seeing you playing there. And then we said, well, we got to talk to that guy. And then maybe it was a week or two later that you were playing the Wetlands that we came out there. Yeah, I mean, if it was a typical Rose Hill night at Freddy's, I'm sure we played for four hours. So you guys have probably had it <laughs> by two hours. So I, yeah, I definitely didn't talk to you guys that night, but um, but I I definitely remember speaking to you at, at Wetlands and coming home with the cassette, you know, yeah. that I listened to over and over and over. Yeah, that had uh, the early Neil classics on it. Um, probably Indian Summer, Silver Dollar. Silver Dollar. She was a loner among the northern lights Passing so gently through this world and I remember her telling me she loved me all her life And she's still waiting there I'm sun um yeah yeah so many rivers to cross yeah buried alive in white buried alive in white <laughs> there's a couple songs on there that didn't quite uh ever see the light of day but from that first batch of demos that he did the uh, the greg mormon demos i believe yeah. yeah can you remember the first time he played with neil yeah sure um he came over to my little apartment i was living above the mount arlington cafe in Mount Arlington, New Jersey. And um, that, that was where I, I was living with my buddy Mark Seibel there at the time. And his parents owned the restaurant underneath. And I was as broke as broke gets, you know? Uh, I mean, we were destitute up there. So, you know, we kind of lived off of, of the restaurant and, you know, just trying to figure it out. And so Neil came over there with an acoustic guitar and I set up a little uh, keyboard that I had and we played, I think we played for three or four days up there, um, just in that little room, 
just playing together and just knocking around his songs and knocking around a couple of Rolling Stones covers and jamming a little bit. And that was, that was, those were the first times up in that little apartment. Yeah. And then I think, I don't know that you, I think you went in the studio with him to play on some of the demos before he even played a gig. If I recall, there were a couple sessions. Um, there was, there was definitely a show place session with, uh, with, uh, the Fadell brothers and Ben Elliott engineering and um, uh, man, what's his name? The late, great Ben Elliott. Um, the late, great Ben Elliott. But who else was on that session? There was another engineer who recorded it. Um, oh, I'll never remember that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I think that was more, I'm guessing that was in the 94 ish range. Uh, I think you probably came into Mormons in 92 and played played a few things there. And it's then possible. in 90. 90- I don't know if it was at Mormons or it might have been Don's place. It might have been Mixolydian. Uh, tough to say. Tough, really yeah. tough to say. Those are, those are cloudy moments because I was, you know, I was carrying the Porter B around and doing whatever I could. So there was a couple Bill Kelly sessions up, oh, yeah. at, up at Don's. Um, and I know Neil was on some of those. So yeah, it's all it's all cloudy as to when the, the actual first sessions were. But but I certainly remember us <clears throat> really figuring it out uh, up at the Mount Arlington spot. And um and there were a couple acoustic gigs that happened downstairs too. You know, we we played there probably five or six times. I'm sure you have it on film somewhere. I have some good recordings of uh the Neil Casal band at the Mount Arlington Cafe. Maybe I'll plug in a little excerpt of one in here yeah that well she's walking through the clouds with the circus mind that's spinning round butterflies and zebras and moons and fairy tales all she ever thinks about is riding with the wind. When I'm down, she comes to me with a thousand smiles. She gets to be free. That's all right. That you can take anything you want from me You can take shows there too with uh with uh ricky rick mayer on bass yeah and angie and myself yeah. i think we would do it as like a four piece or something but no drums i have i have memories of a, of a couple different gigs up there i think kevin spenley might have been on drums on a gig or two there yeah it's mm-hmm. very possible that kevin came down from that yeah, yeah. kevin That's was our cool. friend uh, lives in connecticut, connecticut. now yeah. yeah and um and then, of course, there were a couple, some early great Neil Casal band gigs over in Long Valley at Rosie's, at the Middle Valley Community Center. The community think- Center. Yeah, I have some good footage of just uh, a couple of duo gigs that we did there, just me and Neil, um, just Portaby and acoustic guitar. Yeah. In a little chapel. On, oh, yeah. On a Sunday afternoon in, in November or something. Some of our favorite days. For sure. Yeah, those are crazy memories. Yep, yeah, they really are. And that's when we got to, you know, kind of dig our heels in with all the great musicians from that era and that that spot and just that North Jersey thing. And, you know, yeah, uh, a couple of them from good homes wrestling and yeah, all the, the Todd Schaefer's and man, I was, you know, what a scene that was at the time. 
incredible. It was really great. It was, uh, I feel like Neil got a lot better for playing out in those places with Andy Gessling, Todd Schaefer from Good Homes, uh, Bill Kelly. There were really a bunch of great artists happening around there. And of course, Neil's second record, which we'll get to, was put out by Buy or Die Records at out of Hackettstown, Sound Effects Records, and our pal Jerry Balderson. But um, what do you, I, obviously, you know, we've, we've had a few years there trying to get a record deal after Neil started playing with you and finally got a record deal in late 94 and the beginning of 95 went out to California to record Fadeaway Diamond Time with Jim Scott. And Jim had come out maybe a year or two earlier, a year and a half earlier, and we'd made some demos up in Connecticut at the Carriage House. Um, but what do you what do you remember about Fadeaway Diamond Time in those those days, waiting to get a record deal and waiting to make that first album and meeting Don Heffington and Bob Glaub and Greg Lease? Yeah, I remember a ton that. of conversations with you just trying to figure out how is it possible that we don't have a, a big record deal right away. I, he was so great at that moment, and it was so kind of looking back on it gary it's like it's really kind of what was happening he was a little early if anything neil was neil was a little early to that game yeah you know had he been a little later it might have i don't know it's always hard to say but it was so good at the time we just couldn't understand we'd play all these you know the the big showcase at uh, mercury lounge tonight for all the big wigs everybody's coming you know all the names are coming you know and they, it would just be this constant thing of like He's great. They were great. It was great. And then <laughs> kind of nothing would happen, you know? So when we did get the deal with, with uh, Zoo, you know, that felt like, uh, man, it felt like a big win. And Matthew Sweet was on the label and we knew who he was and we liked his records. And, you know, we were going to be able to, to do our thing with Jim Scott, which had already been set up and planned and already kind of cooking in the oven. So, you know that that was as good as it got i think the the time between when we were really gigging with the band and trying to figure it out and when we went to la and and really sat down with don heffington and bob glaub and and got schooled so hard <laughs> so <laughs> quick me and neil were like wow i mean you know not to speak against the rhythm section that we had because everybody that played with us live was great uh, you know phil and john you know rick and, and and kevin all those cats they were great cats and they all could play but when we went to la and got with the la session guys and really felt what that feels like and what making records feels like it was like this unbelievable uh explosion for us uh, that's something i will not forget you could probably tell better what <laughs> studio it was it was a little place in burbank uh, me and Jim Scott had to carry a B3 around the block to get it in the front door. It was like the first time that we really sat down with Don and Bob. We weren't recording. We were just kind of, you know, feeling it out. Um, and we had, Neil and I had all these ideas, all these demo stuff that, that we loved. And, you know, I, I'll never, ever forget. I can't believe he's gone. But the, the late, great Don Heffington, we we handed him this this kick drum pattern that was totally ridiculous you know that we thought was like smart and cool and we said hey don you don't you, th you think you could try this and he says man even if i could play that i don't think i would <laughs> and we were like wow how cool is that you know man we learned so much from those cats in that first just those first couple days you know and uh to go up there and make the record the way we did it palacio del rio you know there's there's plenty of film and footage and pictures and it's as great as it looks it's, it was as awesome as it appeared what a trip uh yeah i can't say enough about it so that time right there when we were doing those gigs and then we met those guys and then went to palacio that's like the best that's as good as it got for us i think yeah those are magical 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 days and i i remember when when you first started playing with don and bob and that i cannot remember where we did it we did it in some kind of rehearsal room before we ever went to record it just had a little day with those guys and i remember playing uh you guys playing bird in hand 
And I remember Don and Bob kicking in there after that first little intro and was like, whoa, <laughs> it had just, it just had gone up such a high level. And like you said, no, re no disrespect to Ricky, Kevin, uh, Phil Cimino and John Abbey, who subsequently, I actually, I don't think we'd met those guys until after we recorded fade away, but certainly. Yeah, that's Ricky, probably true. That's probably true. But you know, there was definitely a couple different bands. There was a couple different guys that came yeah. through and, you know, all the guys that we had access to, you know, like really the really good, the best of the best in New Jersey, you know, yeah. they're, all, they're all great cats and they all can play. It's not that it's, there's, you know, guys like Don and Bob are one in a million and they they're 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 in hollywood making records for a living you know for the last 40 years yeah <laughs> that's like yeah it's just the difference you know yeah yeah it also like i remember of course you know every we had labored over every note and talked about it for three years and imagined how it would be and then those guys come in and they're just so good and so uh i don't know what the word is pro about it that it just made you and Neil step up your game to a whole other level that you probably didn't even know you had. Oh, and we had to find it quick, like real quick, you know, Yeah. because you, you, you know, it, it, this is only going to work if we're all like playing at that level and we weren't at that level <laughs> and we knew it. But like I said, there's something about, you know, I'm, I play a lot of golf these days, Gary. So I like to equate things with that. The best golf that I play is when I'm playing with really, really good golfers. That's when I can serve it up, you know? So yeah. it's sort of the same kind of thing. Like those guys made us real good, real quick, you know, just by giving us a couple easy concepts and just feeling the groove, just being able to play to a pocket that deep. You kind of can't miss it, you know? It was as obvious as, as could be. And it sounded like records. It sounded like all the stuff that we listened to that we wanted to sound like. Yeah, you go years going like working really hard and going to these studios and doing demos and going, why don't I sound like that record that I love? What is the difference? You know, well, when we got to L.A., we found out the difference. You know, the difference was Jim Scott and uh, and and Don and Bob, Greg Lease, all the cats that we would work with over the years. You know, the Leroy's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Those uh, the the they were, they were great days, and the the proof is still there in Fadeaway Diamond Time. And every time I crank up Fadeaway Diamond Time, it takes me right back to the, those days, and uh, and I love that. And I think the record still still stands up great, and uh, uh, it was a great achievement. And we did go on. You guys, you guys went on the road. You opened some shows for Government Mule, for Little Feet, Little Feet yeah. and uh, things were starting to go pretty well. And then. <laughs> And then our record label folded after three years of trying to get a deal. We finally got a deal and it went horribly wrong. Uh, I believe the day was December 19th, which was oh. three months after the record came out. It was right before Christmas. And I got a call from the president of the label that uh, they were pulling the plug and they weren't going to be able to support Neil's record anymore. And it was basically over. And I remember just being like in disbelief, got off the phone, was trying to digest that and then neil called and in those days there was no cell phones we didn't have cell phones neil called from a payphone from a gig wherever you guys were it might have been nashville and uh, i was like uh looks like we're done man <laughs> and that was that was a tragic day we'd built up to that for so many years and uh but luckily i mean it happened the way it was supposed to when you look back at it he 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 might have sulked for a week or two, but then it was just like, all right, we got to make another record. And that's yeah. that's when we kept going and made Rain, Wind and Speed. Yeah. And I've been asked before, like, so what was, you know, what was it? What was Neil like after that happened? You know, and all you got to do is just put on Rain, Wind and Speed. <laughs> just hit play. Yeah. That'll tell you where Neil was at better than anything. I could, I could sit here and talk for an hour and not get close to it, you know. It was, it's, a, uh, you know, that, that record. record more than any other to me, like really reflects the artist at that moment. So when they come for you, pointing their fingers so cold. Always be happy to put your angels on hold. Your angels on hold. Your angels on hold. 
Um, any tales of when you guys first went out on the road with a band? And I, I believe after we made the record, came back and Neil was trying to figure out who his rhythm section on tour would be. And he came up with these two guys, uh, Phil Semino and John Abbey. They were Lower East Side, New York City musicians. Great, great dudes. And you guys fell together pretty quickly with the with the four of you. And that was a good sound. And off you went on the road. Excellent band. And and it was great having like two real New York, you know, New York cats in, in the van. It was like created a, a great atmosphere. We all got along so great. I remember doing like, I don't want to call them auditions or tryouts. I don't know what they were, but I remember going to New York City with Neil and we had, we booked out a rehearsal room and a couple different cats came through, I think. And um, those two guys played together a lot with, you know, local New York City, Lower East Side artists. They were kind of the, they were the Leroy rhythm section for a lot of people. So, yeah. it, you know, it made sense to get a, a pair like that. And, um, and yeah, they were super talented cats and learned the material great and brought a great energy to the stage we did a lot of shows with them we did a lot of a lot of touring together a lot of super super fun times in the van terry loftus out there with us doing sound dan nappy tour managing <laughs> i mean you, you know it was, it was a great crew and yeah. um and one of the best gigs we played i think was um at nicole and i's wedding in in uh, january 8th 2000 we put the band back together and it was phil and john and neil and me and we played we played a bunch of songs together yeah those guys are awesome man. yeah that was a, that was a great time and then made a couple other records there a little homemade record then went out and made the sunrises here and we'd subsequently had a record deal with a label called glitter house in germany and they were great so supportive they brought you guys over there do you have any memories of that record and then the follow-up which was well i guess it was basement dreams and then anytime tomorrow and first time you guys went over to europe wow that's a loaded question gary <laughs> <laughs> remember that john <laughs> 11 hour drive in a van with no weed i do i i remember <laughs> that i remember that tour because it was extremely difficult <laughs> and looking back on it it's like you know I had some real hard days out there. We all did. And yeah. um, we had we had John Hummel on drums, who's like the most mild-mannered, low-key cat. He could do anything, you know? Like, the, he'd get in the van and the door would shut and he'd be asleep instantly, <laughs> you know? It's like the perfect cat tutorial. I'm kind of the opposite of that, right? So we were in this little uh, Farfig Nugent Volkswagen German van that – um there were no windows that opened in the pass the, the 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 driver and passenger right and there was one seat in the back next to the amplifiers and the drum kit and we would rotate that seat and if you got that seat on the wrong day when you were driving from like you know i don't know the top of italy to you know the bottom of uh, of uh, of france or whatever it was i mean we had some unbelievable treks and if you got that seat back there man i'll tell you it was like uh it was a test it was an endurance test it was a, it was a test of will um and it was back in the day so like you said there were no cell phones like in order to call you and complain i had to like find one of those like phone booths like the big red phone booth thing you know you had to have a calling card and you had to like man it was hard you know we were over there for i think it was six weeks seven weeks something like that and the shows were often great um but you know it was it was on a shoestring so neil was playing through a marshall i had some weird synthesizer on a flock of seagulls keyboard stand like, <laughs> the whole thing was <laughs> it was it was you know we did the best we could with what we had there you know but man that was a rough one that one left that one left some scars for sure yeah, um, yeah. and you know certain memories stand out of of that for me with neil um you know we had we had certain moments together you know when you go through something with somebody that's that's that heavy like you never forget it you know we were going to we finished a show and we were going somewhere in germany and um our, our tour manager said okay well it's only about a 
two hour drive to the hostel. And I said, come again. <laughs> There's no S in hotel. I remember saying that. <laughs> There's no S in hotel. What did you just say? He said, no, we're staying in a youth hostel tonight. And I said, wow, that's okay. This is going to be something. So we ended up in this German youth hostel and, and me and Neil in a bunk beds <laughs> in a room that was shared with, um, I don't know what kind of class trip it was, but some kind of class trip. So it was 40 kids between eight and 12, you know, all in this hallway, one shared bathroom for, for 60 people, <laughs> no. me and Neil in these bunk beds. And like, you know, we get in at three in the morning, four in the morning after the gig and the bell goes off at five 30 and there's, there's 40 kids running around getting ready for their day. And we looked at each other and it was like, there's a, it's a moment I'll never, ever forget, you know, <laughs> just like, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> How does this work? There's no S in hotel, you know? Oh man. Yeah. That was a, that was a trip, but a bunch of great shows. The Amsterdam shows were great. Um, made lots of great music on that tour. Um, Dave DeCastro on bass, Joe Wilkinson on guitar, um, John Hummel and, uh, Susanna our tour manager oh yeah um i'll ask you one last question about those those days which resulted in a song uh one of the last shows you guys did supporting fadeaway diamond time i believe was late january of of uh, 1996 I know where you're going. and i remember seeing you guys off uh from new jersey you were gonna go to pittsburgh play the gig and drive back, which was about six hours. And the reason you were gonna drive back is a massive snowstorm was on the way. And you got in the van, we had a nice tour van, put the trailer on, and you headed out to Pittsburgh. I remember I remember seeing you guys off. And then I went home, had a cozy fire, and uh, just enjoying my winter night. And you guys went out there, played the gig, I remember Neil calling and it was like, all right, well, we're going to try to head back. Like there's, we're going to try to beat the storm. So I'll let you pick it up from there after you left Nick's graffiti city yeah, and tried to say, head back hey, to New Jersey. I don't remember the gig, but I remember <laughs> the drive home. So yeah, we, uh, we plowed through the night and it, it actually wasn't that bad. It was like a normal snowstorm. And mind yeah. you, we're in a, we're in a 15 passenger van and a full double axle trail okay so it, it wasn't that bad that night and so we actually stopped somewhere and we only had i think you know about four four and a half hours to go right and we said you know we can do this if this stays like this the tractor trailers are running we can stay behind a tractor trailer everything's gonna be fine we're gonna make it and it became this like determination we're gonna make it um so we drove and drove and drove and it was with really, really slow conditions, but it, but drivable until the sun went down and I was driving and, um, the windshield wiper on the driver's side flew off. Okay. <laughs> so with the conditions like that, that was over. It was, that was in trouble. So I remember we pulled over, we took the other windshield wiper off. We took a couple hair ties. We hair tied it to the driver's side which worked but didn't work great and so there was this little kind of window that i had to see through and i followed this tractor trailer until i just couldn't follow him anymore he disappeared the tracks disappeared there were no lights out there midway pennsylvania which is midway between i think bethlehem and poconos or something so um said that's it we got a bail like we're we're I, we can't see anything. We got a bail. We saw lights off to the right hand side, hit the exit ramp, kind of steady, you know, and literally beached this thing into the exit ramp into a huge pile of snow as far as I could get the thing to go. We climb out and we go up to this, this midway, the midway motel, it was called. Now, I've stayed in some bad motels before, and I've stayed in hotels that have S's in them called hostels. You've never stayed in anything like the Midway Motel. This place, it's since been bulldozed, thank God. But 
I mean, it, it was it was a room with a bed, and that was it. There was no heat. There was no running water. There was no food. There was no nothing. There was absolutely nothing. Um, so Dan Nappy and I, Dan, the tour manager, we we got into a room. We finally got into a room, and we were huddled up, and we had nothing to smoke, and we had nothing to drink, and it was like it was a rough, rough night. Somehow we managed to fall asleep, wake up the next day, and there's a foot of snow inside the room (laughs) coming in through the cracks of the door, right? Because, you know, your door just went out to the parking lot. It's just a one-level deal. So I opened the door, and it was literally, it was snow (laughs) all the way to the top. Like, you were trapped. The world was over. It was done. It's you're, You're never getting out. You know, we were literally shocked, uh, uh, startled, you know, so we start punching through and I can see some daylight. OK, so the, the snow drifted up against the door. So it's only about, I don't know, four feet high, <laughs> you know, in actuality. So we said, we got to go to the van. Let's get to the van. It was it was all we could do to walk through this, to trudge through it and roll across it to get to the van. So it turns out in the light of the day, the van was literally a foot away from going in the ditch, a big ditch filled with water. Uh, we missed it by a foot. I missed it by a foot. We, we couldn't have been more lucky. Um, hmm. So we gather up everything. We say, we got to get the hell out of here. There's no way we're spending another night in this place. All the highways were closed. State of emergency. Route 78 is completely closed. There's not a car on it. So we throw all the bags across the snow out to the street. We roll across the snow out to 78. Me and Neil and the band walk two miles up Route 78. The only thing that passed us was an Army Humvee. Um, There were cars beached everywhere. And we found a little comfort inn up there and checked into that place. Dan Nappy found a backhoe, paid some guy 60 bucks with a backhoe to go chain our van and yank it out of that the spot that it was in and put it back on the highway. We eventually got home sometime the next morning, sometime the next day we were, they opened the highways and we were able to go home. So (laughs) what should have been a six hour drive turned into, I don't know, 40 something hours. (laughs) And yeah, it's pretty much all detailed in the song midway. What made you stop here anyway? It's on the field recordings album, but that tells the story of that insane day. Um, yeah, I, I remember that. I, and, and of course, Nicole, your your wife of many years, and and I, we both lived in Morristown, and I remember like everything was shut down in Morristown too. And I think I walked into the center of town from one part of the side of town, and she walked in from the other side of town, and we met up and uh, oh, shared some something to smoke i believe at the time yeah i don't doubt it i mean it was you know this is it's 96 too so it's not like uh it's not like it is now where you get a storm like that every couple weeks you know like yeah that was a that was the first like storm of the century that was a historic one january 96 yeah it lived Um, up to its name i mean that was a lot of snow yeah well you subsequently went on to play on every neil solo album and of course you've played with Jewel, the Dixie Chicks, Citizen Cope, Robert Randolph and the Family Band, now the Allman Betts Band. You have your own band. Um, 
any other i want to i want to talk about um a couple tracks you produced on highway butterfly but any other recording memories on neil's solo stuff anything you remember that was oh, important man. i mean they, they kind of all you know they sort of blend together after you know once we get past you know uh anytime tomorrow probably yeah yeah because after that like he, he kind of broke off and started using different producers and I, i'd still i'd still get the call and i'd still play on it but some a lot of the stuff i played in this room right behind me you know um and did it remote or you know it was just a day or, or two here or there you know yeah. like uh the recording side of Neil, like I, I always loved that he called me and it always seemed like I had a, a part somewhere. I always had a home somewhere on every record that he ever did. And, and I loved that, you know, and it was never, I was never as involved as I was on the first couple ones just because, you know, wh why would you, you know, I wouldn't have done the same thing either, you know, um, he, he had done a couple records with, with me and Jim and, and the team and he kind of wanted to break out of that and i don't you know i don't blame him at all so it was just done different you know but those first couple records you know i was i was his guy and i loved being his guy i really really enjoyed it i enjoyed writing the charts for all those songs doing the demos yeah. you know i was like super thorough about all that stuff i made sure we went in like prepared you know i was music directing without ever asking or having that title you know um we kind of always compared it to like the david lindley to jackson brown thing you know yeah i like to think that i was this guy for that that period of time you know yeah well there's no doubt like you you were neil's main sidekick there for many years and the sound that you and neil and angie mckenna on harmony vocals made was really the that was the first five years of neil's solo career that was the sound and i love that sound so much and, yeah that sound aged well yeah um not so much but the sound great <laughs> yeah what do you uh i know the last few years of neil's life you know i mean you and i talk quite a bit and i'd always fill you in on what neil was going through some stuff i don't know how much you talked to him but um, you remember much about that last year of his life or the last time you saw him yeah he shut me out you know and it, it's i know it's it's the same i mean you were always this guy. You were always there for him. So I, I don't think it was the same for you. But for for us that were in that original time period, and a lot of that had, you know, not just with the music, but also like, you know, his wife, Christy Coleman, you know, like all of us that were involved in that part of Neil's life, he made sure that that we kind of got pushed to the side when it came to the last years of his life, yeah. you know. I, it was rare that I got a straight answer out of the guy, you know, um, everything was vague and everything was short and everything was, you know, he'd change the subject quicker than anybody, you know, he just yeah. didn't want to, he didn't want to talk about that shit with me. And, uh, you know, part of that was really aggravating because obviously in the last year of his life, there were signs that there were real trouble. And I, you and I would talk and I'd go like, are you kidding me? Like what? And when he took a break from the CRB and this whole thing and, you know, there's all this drama going on and I didn't know about it and I didn't understand it. And I would just reach out to him and say, you know, like, you know, my house is open to you. I have, you know, that room is upstairs is yours. You know, this studio like is yours. Just you don't even have to tell anybody. Just just come here, you know, and just hold up and, and you know, figure it out like you. And he always, you know, I'd get a one sentence reply to that. Like, yeah, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. You know, that was, that was the last thing he said to me was, um, uh, everything's going to work out. Mm. That was the last thing he said to me. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it didn't work out, you know, that didn't no. work out. So, you know, it, it's as much as you could try to, to get in there, you know, I think, you know his running buddies at the time knew what was up you know they they were way more keyed into it than i was at the time so yeah. i just tried to like i just tried to be be the friend and be the bro and you know our last couple conversations uh he loved that i was in the almond bets band and he 
He loved him some Dwayne Betts. Uh, they got to play together actually a couple of days before Neil passed. They they played together. Um, he was a big fan, and he he loved that I was doing that. Um, and we talked about the Kenny Roby record he was going to produce, and I was gonna I was gonna maybe get on a track or two with that. There was yeah. you know there was plans. It was normal. It was normal. Everything was you know. So yeah, I was just you know despite the warnings i was still totally floored that night you called and i was sitting right here you called yeah. it you called it 11 30 at night and anytime gary calls me at 11 30 at night i know it's not a good thing no and uh yeah that certainly was no no exception well um yeah that's that was a very painful last couple of years there for sure um but I, I do want to talk about Highway Butterfly. You produced two great tracks on there. So the Almond Betts Band did uh, Raining Straight Down, which is one of my favorite Neil songs, and, and you made that happen. And also you produced the Angie McKenna track, um, which is uh, Fell in Hard Times. So any, uh, any thoughts on those two tracks? Yeah, I was, you know, uh, honored to, to be able to, to do that. Um, that wasn't the original plan, you know, it was sort of a, I guess you'd call it a COVID producing because <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's simply because of, of the pandemic that we kind of got shut down from the original idea that everybody's going to go to pliers and everybody's going to do it with Jim and Dave. And yeah, and that plan was working great until the thing hit and this became a hot potato project. So, um, it was important to get Angie on there for sure. She was such a huge part of of everything that neil did on those first couple records and like you said just the sound of them singing together it just made it made a sound made a beautiful sound so yeah. it was important to get her on there um and to do that we figured well let's let's just get the band back together you know so uh, i called the europe band the europe touring band and um even had uh, even joe wilkinson got on an airplane and flew all the way from los angeles to be here for the session so Dave DeCastro, John Hummel. Yeah, we put the band back together after 22 years yeah. and uh, and recorded that song right in this room behind me. So that was super cool. Angie is great. Her voice is as great as ever. Uh, she totally killed it. Since I fell on hard times I haven't known what to do I spend my days here in life and Betts thing almost didn't happen i mean it had every reason in the world to not happen it's it was sort of a miracle that we we could pull it off it was one of the last tracks that got done and i've been talking to jim and you know we really wanted to get the band on there because it's well it's my band you know and it's like you know i should yeah. have my band on there so um and they're so great and it's such a you know for for the for us to do a neil casal song was just like that, you know this is going to be great we just got to pick the right one so i think we had four or five choices i played for devin and Dwayne, and we all came to 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 that one as the strongest one and we had like we literally had a couple of days off in st louis and i called chris turnbaugh and got his studio for a couple hours and we slammed it in there and you know it just 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 barely managed to get it in so it's a great track and we actually play it live. It ends up in the set list. Everybody loves the song and loves playing it. The grass is high back at home now. No time to stomp or even sleep.
in a weird twist uh, on this last tour we had mark ford opening for us hmm. who from the black crows he played on southern harmony which was one of our favorite records when it sure came was. out that was like what we were trying to kind of reach you know with neil and neil was such a huge fan of mark's playing on that record so when mark was opening for us on the store i said hey man will you come sit in on on rain and straight down so he came and played it with us and i kind of looked over uh, uh, as we're playing it and i'm watching him tear up this solo and just thinking wow like that's a <laughs> weird full circle thing to have yeah. playing that song you know with yeah. Neil. that's wild yeah yeah well i love that you guys are playing that live i love that that song is living on and uh hopefully some of the other other artists on the record will will also add that their songs to their sets so yeah they should because i tell you what every night when Devin introduces it and said says you know this is by neil casal like people know the place the place goes up i you yeah. know we've been wearing these neil casal foundation t-shirts and hoodies and stuff mark mark brought the band you know a box of everything yeah and um I can't tell you, Gary, how many times, you know, the guy at the sandwich shop or the uh, lighting director at the local theater or you name it comes up to somebody and goes, oh, man, Neil Cassell, you know, he was so great. Like it, it mm -hmm. happens 20 times a day when these guys wear their, their Neil Cassell hoodies, you know, a lot yeah. of people know him, a lot of people. Yep. Well. Wow. You know the it, these these years went by very quickly. You always hear that when you're young. You know, enjoy it while you can because it goes by quick. And it turns out that it's really true. It does go by quick. Um, but you know, the we we have so much to be proud of the the role, roles that we played in. You know, Neil's Neil's solo albums. And uh, when I listen back to those early albums, and I hear the parts he played, and I know how much care and love went into it. So. Thank you for that. And uh, the, that stuff will live on forever. And, um, you know, there's so many other great Neil songs that didn't make it onto Highway Butterfly. So who knows when volume two could happen. So yeah, get ready for that it, one. You, could find, uh, you, you could find enough to do it. And that's, a, it's a pretty amazing thing, digging into the guy's work like this and seeing what he actually did. And so yeah. many great songs. But yeah, but thank you for that. Uh, that means the world to me. And, you know, I appreciate everything that you did for neil cassell over the past mm -hmm. 30 years man this like so much hard work went into it and so much love and all the way around you know we were a great yeah. team and that's why that's why fadeaway diamond time sounds like it does yeah well yeah i'll never forget those days and the that uh waiting to make fadeaway diamond time sitting out there under joshua tree losing our minds waiting for the recording studio to become available. So can't take that stuff away. Those are classic memories that I'll, Indeed. I'll never forget. So, yep. well, thanks, man. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, I hope I see you soon and, um, be safe out there on the road when you go back out and, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Will do. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it, man. All right. See ya. This podcast is brought to you by backline, the music industry's mental health and wellness resource hub. Launched in 2019, Backline gives artists, crews, and their families quick and easy access to mental health and wellness resources. Backline provides individuals with case management and offers virtual support groups as well as yoga, meditation, and breath work. To donate, learn more, or get in touch for personalized care, visit backline.care. That's B-A-C-K-L-I-N-E dot c a r e thanks for listening to highway butterfly the stories of neil casal tune in next week to hear more from the artists who made this tribute album a reality highway butterfly the songs of neil casal is out on november 12th all album net proceeds go to the neil casal music foundation you can pre-order the album and learn more at neilcasalmusicfoundation.org.